All right. Uh, what is going to be, I'm sure, a quite, quite explosive chat with uh, Creeper Frontman and what I will get out of the way now, one of my best friends in the world, Will Gould. Will, how the devil are you, sir? Terry, I'm doing fantastic. Thank you very much. <laughs> I've got a pumpkin here. Oh, no, this way. A pumpkin <laughs> here, a pumpkin there. Uh, this whatever this is a cat a cat a skull cat and uh, a, a, a skull bat as well how, how are you Terry how are you doing I'm great man I'm really great I've looked forward to this for ages because you recorded the record literally around the corner from my house a lot of the incidents around the record happened here and we have purposefully not spoken about it both in the moment and since everything went down because we've saved it all for this chat so I guess the place where I want to start this is right at the very beginning, which is yourself and your songwriting partner in crime, Mr. Ian Miles, were out here on what I will politely call a covert operation because nobody knew you were here until me and my wife were walking around the corner to the now defunct Loteria Mexican restaurant and bumped into quite literally skipping down Hollywood Boulevard Will Gould and Ian Miles. So let's take, let's go back to that moment and where you were at that point in time. You'd just done the great disappearing act at Coco. Um, there was a lot of mystique around Creeper, which is always when it's at its best. Um, the feeling of coming off the back of the eternity in your arms cycle and you and Miles being here on that first visit when you were scouting out who would make this record with you. So basically the way that went down was it was a very interesting time in our band because we just performed that great vanishing act uh, like in, in November. And um, it was it had upset some people. It, it made some people quite mad of us. It, had, uh, it was a completely necessary thing, though. What I had to make very clear is that like we couldn't have, we wouldn't still be a band now if we hadn't taken that year off. Uh, as with everything with Creeper, it's it's a covert operation. Everything is done like in, in a clandestine way. So when we when we land in Los Angeles and we start going around the, the houses, meeting different people to, to try and work out what to do with the album, what to do where we want to go with it, I knew it had to be what I've coined now is aggressive evolution. Um, it had to be aggressive evolution. And all of my favorite acts and bands have, have followed a very similar sort of principle with that sort of thing. And uh, I saw so so we very purposefully keeping on the, on the down low. But much with everything with this record, life and the universe has presented things to me and just gone, here you go, like that. Mm -hmm. And so on this day, on this day in, in, in uh, what me and Ian Dickinson call our manager, uh, Chaos City. Uh, Chaos City is like a, like a Mad Max city where everything's on fire all the time and you're trying to tend to one place but there's another place standing up behind you and uh, there's one man who knows about Chaos City is Terry Beezer uh, he's living, <laughs> he, he, like, I, I, think, I think, you think you were born and raised in Chaos City uh, Yeah, yeah I, I think I'll quote Bane in the uh, or is it Batman where he says I was born here <laughs> yeah. you, 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 you really adopted you, you, really, you really adopted the darkness <laughs> Oh my god, I'm gonna laugh too much in this interview. I always pulled the laptop open yeah. for the first time. Yeah. Um, um, yeah so, uh, so basically, like uh, then, so Terry says. So suddenly we realise, oh no. Well, Terry knows now, and uh, so we can't like, like, like uh, that now. It's time immediately. Me, me and I are super excited because we know what this means uh, now, and uh, immediately that means. The uh, hotel we've been staying at, which was um, at that point, it was in Burbank, if you remember, bees. Uh, mm -hmm. at the Holiday Inn, they had this amazing, amazing bar downstairs called The Casting Call, which is always very funny to me because it being in Hollywood called The Casting Call. Um, yeah. then, no uh, self-awareness. <laughs> no self-awareness whatsoever. As, uh, as uh, I, we were telling bees about it, we are like, well, we started drinking that night immediately, first night, straight away, immediately. <laughs> It's like there was no gap in it. We immediately started hanging out. And um, it's just one of the things, again, like Beas was saying this now to you, uh, that he was looking forward to this interview. I have been looking forward to it as well, very much so, because 
Uh, Bees plays has played such an important part in it, not just the not just this story, but like kind of the whole Creeper story in general. And over the course of this record, it's became even closer than we were before. It's uh, been this friendship that I've really treasured. And uh, so anyway, we take Bees back to of all places to go in Hollywood, of all the places you can go. This is Hollywood. You like you like, <laughs> like you know what Hollywood is. Hollywood's a, a madhouse of, of things that are going on everywhere all the time. Bees makes his way over to a Holiday Inn. Uh, in Burbank, and we all go drinking at the uh, at the casting call where it's karaoke night. And there is a man who is dressed exactly like uh, like Bono from U2. He's wearing the, the shades, the, the jacket, and he exclusively sings U2 songs. <laughs> be, 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 it's be, the weirdest be, thing I've ever seen, and I live here. <laughs> he was Bono. It was bizarre. It was so weird. Yeah. Like you're like, what is going on with this guy? So yeah, he like he's there. Bees, uh, we we all absolutely get completely spangled that day. Uh, we, <laughs> we get really very very drunk, and it was it was very very fun because suddenly, like one of our allies had kind of rumbled us, and, uh, and, <laughs> and, and, and but, but but he kind of promised to keep the secret as well. So then so suddenly Bees was in the inner circle of people that knew about this thing that was happening. Uh, he, he he'd known about what happened at home, and he, he like he knew about like what we'd done. We spoke about that very briefly, but we. Spent a lot of the night just kind of singing and beat bees. What song did you sing? I have a video of it on my phone. Uh, I I took the floor. Like just so you know, everybody, my singing voice sounds exactly how you would imagine it does. It sounds like I it this. Good. I it sounds it like, no, no, I Will, it was good. no, Will, I, you are you are a be beautiful human, and I appreciate you saying it. But no, I sung "Heaven" by Brian Adams, and I absolutely, yeah, mass I absolutely massacred it. <laughs> well, if someone tweets me after they've seen this, tweet tweet me at Will Gould with a H instead of a uh, just Gould. I will um, I will share the video. With, Be with, Be <laughs> with Beezy's permission, with Beezy's permission, I'll share the video. Cheers, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so so we were we were there, and um, just just because I've I've never actually directly asked you this question, how did you and Ian meet? Because you and you and Ian are more than just people that are in a band together, right? I've interviewed everyone there is to interview, and there are there are people that are in bands together. There are people that are close because of their band and then you meet people like you and Ian whose friendship and relationship transcends even this creeper thing that you've put your entire beings into how how the fuck did you first meet well the, the first time we we, we 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 met basically from punk rock really like i like he played in a, a ridiculous metal band like and, and Ian's old band his first band when i met him just had endless beatdowns. It was just beat down, <laughs> beat down, beat down. It was just so heavy, as you can imagine. Like a, a kid who grew up on Metallica, but then mm. got into like hit, like 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 kind of like more modern metal. Like you imagine the sort of thing that kid is into. Um, yeah, it was just so so heavy all the time. Like like and, and, like it was just a series of beatdowns that were sewn together by little tiny other bits. But it was just, it was all about the beatdowns. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and like, one of my best friends, uh, John Dalton, uh, played in uh, in that band, and he's like this drummer. Um, he's still one of our best friends today. Like everything with Creeper, we still send to him before we send anywhere else. Like we just amazing. Get, yeah, we get the sign off from him. We go, is this good or are we dreaming? And and he'll tell you. He's he's like Beast. Like Beast is the same thing. Ooh. Like be, you, you just need to say as it is straight away. There's no like. You know, he's not going to be nice to you because he's your mate. He's going to be real, and that's what I love about you, uh, Beast. Like it's the same way I love about John. But yeah, so those guys played in this band together, did this uh, ridiculous thing. I was uh, putting on shows for one. I was doing gigs myself, uh, like organizing shows. I played in like a screamo band uh, called Little Girl Lost that Ian thought, I I Ian tells me now, he thought we were a bunch of posers, he said. He said, I thought you were a bunch of posers. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is so funny because then Ian would join uh, my band years later and then get called a poser himself years later. You know, like <laughs> after the Creeper, people when we first had Creeper, everyone was like, "Well, where have they come from? Like, what? How, mm. how? How did they get signed?" It was like, you know, we played in the band for seven years before this, and the reason you don't know about that band is because you were at that show and no one else was. So we played to two people yeah. every single day for years in squats in Europe. Like uh, we were. Very much, uh, we went very, very hard in our early, early years. So Ian and I met. I always wanted to play with Ian. Um, I like, but by the time we actually became proper, proper friends, we played one show together, 
at the Railway Inn in Winchester. Winchester is very posh, but this this place is like a one hundred cap room. It was just carnage. It was just fucking crazy. Um, I also lost my virginity in the park behind them, uh, Bees. Uh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> yeah, I, I, it was broken up by a policeman. <laughs> Yeah, it was uh, it was to it was to a policeman. No, 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 no. no. So it was like one of those things at the time. Like we were like involved in punk rock and stuff. So we used to have parties in this field behind. I don't know why I'm sharing this with you. Like, like, yeah, go for it. Um, so uh, we used to have parties in this field behind um, the, the the railway inn. Uh, and I like me and this girl like we, like who became my girlfriend. Uh, it was the first time I lost my virginity, and it got broken up by a copper who like he'd like broken up the party. Like, uh, and it, <laughs> And he, it was at night, obviously. So he shone his torch on me and just went, put it away, son. <laughs> <laughs> Eggplant emojis all over the place. Yeah. <laughs> put, put it away, son. I was like, Jesus That's Christ. amazing. So anyway, um, anyway, yeah, it's so, it's so funny. So Ian and I made friends there. Ian started a youth crew band called Take Him Out. I played in another youth crew band. This is at the time where like hardcore just went like bang. It's, it, now it's happening like yeah. you know American uh, kind of Amer- American hardcore like was a big big thing. Ch- Champion were a big band at the time. Uh, like all the bridge Amazing. nine, all the bridge nine stuff was really happening. We were like we all love Gorilla Biscuits and all that stuff. Like we just, so we were just like in, in these kind of posy hardcore bands for for a, a hot minute. After him was in the most negative band in the world. Uh, <laughs> uh, and so so we started all this stuff. Our first tour ever together was um it was Arthur Band here and his band that were called Take Em Out, like EM with a you know take yeah. take take em out, take em out. Love uh, it. And so we we, we it was our first ever tour. We we didn't know how to tour because we'd never done it before. And so we rented two vans that had three seats at the front of each of them and just a flat back. Uh so like so but it was not there was nine people. So we just loaded all the gear into the back of one of them, and the other three of us who didn't have seats just laid down in the back of the van, <laughs> just smushing around like this. <laughs> uh, that, that was our first tour, but we, and we played in different bands. Uh, but like we were just punk kids, really, like this kind of shitty, weird punk kids. And uh, Ian, Ian's mum, I remember Ian went to university to, to study film, um, and I would stay at Ian's university building quite a lot. Um, it's always kind of been a way of me and Ian where like, where one of us gets something good and then everyone else just kind of jumps in. You know, it's like, it's even a job. Mm. I'm, like, I'm like, oh, I've got this cool deal, you know. Uh, got this, this, this cool deal selling love film. Um, come, come, come do this. So everyone gets in. We hold the door open for one another. So Ian had this cool university building. It was like, come stay as much as you want. Come, come stay whenever you want. So we'd, uh, we'd do that uh, all the time. We'd stay there a lot. And then he went back to his mum's house. But his mum had rented out all the rooms in her house in Romsey. Like, like uh, she had like just, just a regular estate in Romsey, uh, just rented all the rooms out illegally to the, the, the council didn't know, to lodges. So like, just to, just, to, just to make some extra money. So like, Ian couldn't move back in. Uh, <laughs> so Ian ended up living in the shed in the garden. And now Bees, I, 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 What, I, I, like I, Shaun of the Dead? <laughs> like Nick Frost at the end of Shaun of the Dead? I gotta make it very clear that like, so, sometimes when I tell this story, people go, Oh, so did he have like an outhouse? No, 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 no. 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 The, the, a shed. There's a, there's a shed where, where his mum kept tools uh, and, and, and a lawnmower. And so like Ian, like uh, I, I was going through a really difficult time in my uh, my life at that point, especially like, you know, with my living situation. Mm. And uh, so we ended up like for a period of time, kind of like, yes, had me over all the time. We were kind of both living there for a while. And that's how we kind of met. And that's how he started writing songs together, like slowly, his his band broke up and it was a scramble. Southampton's so weird because it's so incestuous with bands at the time it was that everyone played each other's bands. But as soon as that one broke up, it was like scrambles, like with marbles, you know, the, the, who got Ian. And I didn't get him in time. He got he, he got taken by another band. And I was like, oh, it's so annoying. <laughs> so I was waiting for my time to get him. And I finally got him. And I finally had him join Our Time Down Here, uh, which is my band at the time. And then he was, then he was mine, and uh, yeah, and that—that's the story. That's how we met. We so, lived in his shed. We did, we did a Hanoi Rocks cover in his mum's shed. Dead by Christmas. Which song? Amazing, <laughs> amazing, amazing. I will take that up with you another time. Um, so, is it an exaggeration to say that when you get through the first three Creeper EPs and you get to the end of everything that you achieved on eternity and you're on your arm, um, do you think you and Ian need each other? Yeah, a hundred percent. I think that, like, uh, I mean, this band 
wouldn't exist if it wasn't if, 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 if mine and his relationship that's kind of that's kind of what spawned this all you know ian, ian miles is like a horror nerd uh i'm like a nerd in a lot of a lot of different things you know like, like glam glam rock and uh Hmm. And into art and into into poetry and things, but it's like the combination of the hybrid of our different interests, you know, and, and, and writing styles. It's a, it's kind of a a symbiotic thing. We kind of uh, that that's the way this whole the whole thing works. And um, it's can, been. Can I, yeah, go ahead. Can I ask what does Ian make better for you? Everything. Uh, like yeah. Yeah. When it comes to your songwriting, when it comes to your songwriting, how so, does he how, how does he make Will Gould better? Let me let me let, let me show you something. Uh, like, yeah. The best way I can describe this is, is to show you something. So wait one sec. You do it, man. <laughs> I'll just fill in some time here. I have no idea. He could pull out pull out anything here. A severed head, a pair of soft stockings. This could be anything. <laughs> So, this here is a keyboard I bought from Argos uh, back <laughs> in maybe, I don't know, I must have been 18 when I bought this. It's got this button that like you'll all be familiar with, DJ, DJ, uh, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> one, 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 and uh, where is it? Dictionary, dictionary, dictionary. I wrote, I wrote this song, on, on, I, I've written more Creeper songs than this than you can imagine. Like, there is right. a... I've written so many Cooper songs on this piece of shit keyboard. It, 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 it is, this, this thing fucking sucks, man. The keys, <laughs> the, keys, the keys aren't weighted. They're not weighted keys. They have the same amount. It hasn't got a pedal. It, I bought it from No Arthur. give, yeah. Yeah, it, so, so, so they're not weighted like a regular thing. You can't, the velocity of how you hit them doesn't matter. Anyway, yeah. so I've written numerous Creeper things on this uh, horrible thing. And I think, in fact, it has an R time down here sticker on it, which no one, no one's seen this before, Bees. This is weird showing you this. Amazing. That is an R time down here sticker that B, that, that uh, Bane, uh, our old drummer, did. Uh, I said Bane. His name's Shane. We used to call him Bane um, because right. he was uh, a gnarly dude. He's an amazing, amazing <laughs> artist. He had this R time down here sticker on the back of that. So I've had this all the way back from those days. And I still write on this to this, to this very day. So... The song on that record, we, the new record we put out, you've heard these that no one else has. Mm -hmm. um, the song Thorns of Love that you're speaking about, I wrote, I wrote that song on that keyboard. Uh, it's not a punk song anymore. We're, we're, we're on different things, but I wrote it on that keyboard. And what I do is I'd write on that keyboard and, uh, and play it awfully, uh, like terribly on that keyboard. <laughs> I'm, an, I'm an awful piano player. I'm terrible. Right. Um, but but like, I'm, I, I like to think I'm a decent songwriter. I just... I was a terrible piano player, um, and Ian and Ian's always known that as well. Like, uh, but like, so what I would do is, I just kind of play it on that. I know chords, and I, I know how you know the shape of chords and things. I learned it over the years, and uh, like with punk rock, you learn on the go, you know. And I think mm, it's absolutely. But like, we're, we're covering the same cloth, me and you, and I think that's uh, speaking to you. We 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 learn uh, things in a similar manner. It's kind of in the field mm. doing doing them, like you know, getting out and doing it, like, and so like. So I would, I would, I would write, I wrote Thorns of Love on this song, uh, on this uh, keyboard, um, and then I'd send a voice note to Ian, and Ian takes that 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 weird voice note, and then completely transforms it and makes it into what it is, uh, like like what you've heard versus what I what I've done. Like the, the nucleus of that is this small thing that I've written on this Argos keyboard from I don't know, two thousand and nine, two thousand eight. I don't know. Yeah, I bought this. But like, like it still works. I, I've lost the charger now, though, so I have to use a, a laptop charger that doesn't quite fit in the back. So I have to keep it at the right angle to use. And, Mate, uh, where there's a where there's a will, there's a way. <laughs> there you go. But yeah, that's that's what he does. That's what that, that Ian Ian is, is amazing. He's a genius. He's, he's, a, he's a, a freaky genius. So when you boil all of that up, I'll take us back to that night in Hollywood, and that day you had met. Zandy Barry, which is a name that won't be super familiar with everybody here. But to me, it was a real pivotal moment in the story we are about to tell, because what excited you both at that point in time is even more relevant now that the record is finished and done. And then that, that Zandy Barry was going to take you and make you sound like nobody else. And that includes the creeper that people know. Uh, how much was that the mission statement when you went into this record? 
well, I felt like at the time I was thinking that we'd we'd uh, we'd done three EPs and the album with the same thing. I felt like mm. you, you fall you fall into a trap with this industry. What happens is uh, you have a little bit of success, and then you uh, uh, and you have that success while you're being extremely creative, while you're like uh, going through this period where you you're fearless and reckless. And then when you've made some money and you, you're okay, you're comfortable, mm. you go, oh my goodness, I had to replicate that success. So um, let's just give them what they want every single time. Now the the real trick is like here um, that the, 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 the secret to know is that anyone who's any good never gives anyone what they want. You don't do that at all. That's not what that's not what all my heroes did. Uh, you have to. Prove that you can do something else. M m move Will. aside from that. Will, do you remember when, when Mechanical Adam came out after Antichrist Superstar? It was exactly. mad. It was absolutely mad in terms of like, wow, this is so not what I expected. And that's what makes us talk about that man with the reverence that we do. Exactly. Like, so, so, for example, like Mechanical Animals is a record we, we reference so many times when making this one. Even though our record sounds ah. nothing like Mechanical Animals. Like, it sounds nothing like that. We spoke mm. about it all the time. Because he was, uh, he was very much influenced as well, obviously, by David Bowie, uh, which was, uh, was, was basically what he was doing with that record. He was, uh, his own version, his, like, his own shape and his own form, taking on that uh, kind of... That mindset about how when you're when you're being creative, you have to be selfish. You have to be really, really selfish and be bold of it. How people told me when I was with you and I told you Bees, I was like, I, I, I would meet up with Bees and Bars afterwards and go, some of the day told me that we should only really progress by twenty percent, otherwise we're gonna we're gonna alienate the entire audience. That happens so many times, and I was like, you know what? My audience is so much more clever than you're giving them credit for. Like, yes, they're, they're, mate. They're, they're yes. like, like they're, they're, these are these are fans of rock music. We're not fans of pop music. Yes. Like you, you, you know, it. if you if, you, if you're yes. into if you're into pop music, you, you, you don't have something challenging. You're probably listening to the wrong band because this is that this whole the whole idea of this is that it's it's it's, it's complicated and it's nuanced and that it's going to evolve and shape shift. Like uh, we speak about about like AFI that's constantly challenged and changed and 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 rely on the listener to be uh, fluid and move with them. Like that's that was my favorite band growing up, but David Bowie did that, Madonna did that. Like for me, yes, for me, we have we have to to, to move forward, and like it's it's always it's always the less interesting acts and the the acts that have one good record that make the same that make the same thing over and over again. Um, I, this is my opinion. I completely agree i was the, just so everyone knows the reason i was shouting yes at him i was trying to hold that in as much as possible i could not agree more will um this is where this chat gets a bit choose your own adventure mate because how you, <laughs> how how you answer this next question is gonna kind of inform the rest of this chat because it's a basic question but how would you describe the making of sex death and the infinite void Oh my goodness! I could, I could I could describe that in quite a few ways too. Probably probably be go for it. Traumatic, romantic. Uh, I think uh, scarring, um, cursed, uh, hexed. I think it, it was um, littered with with, with dramatics. Uh, something uh, fa like, like fictional, factual, uh, a, a mixture of the two. Um, it is. It is the single most extreme experience I've ever I've ever witnessed. I've never known uh, anything anything like the year that I went through making this record. It is it, 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 it almost uh, it, it, it almost finished my band off, and and, and you know it, like, it affected me in such a way that I was in a very deep dark place for 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 quite a significant amount of it. And actually, some of the evenings that like it's lovely doing this chat with you, and I hope. Uh, your viewers don't mind me having a drink with you, bees. Uh, like I, I, I know it. it's, a, it's a little yes. unprofessional. It's a little unprofessional, but I felt like <laughs> more, more, like more than anyone else. Uh, <laughs> when, when we're doing this exact specific, specific chat, like yeah. I would be having a beer with my friend bees and talking about this, and this sofa would be his, and we'd be sat there, which is just a, just around the corner from where he is right now. Yes, um, and we, we'd be having a beer. So I wanted to, I wanted to make it similar to, to mm. a, a, an experience we would have together. 
so yeah, that it has been an out an, an otherworldly experience. I've never experienced mm -hmm. anything like it before. It is outrageous. Well, let's get let's get the downer stuff out of the way first, right? Because it's interesting that you come to the word extreme. Because when I was thinking about what I know of your experience making this, the only word that I kept coming back to was extremes, uh, highs and lows. And we'll get, I think it's right to build to those highs. So let's, let's get the other stuff out of the way first. Because there was a little period, Will, where it felt like every two or three weeks, the world was raining shit on you. If you, if you don't mind me being totally point blank with it. Um, how did you cope with it? Because we were we were together for bits of it, but I think that well, I'll talk about about how I felt at that time in a second. But how did, how were you coping with when things were wobbling? Because people are going to hear the Creeper podcast, right, and they're going to get a lot of the incident. What I want to ask you about is your feelings with the weight of all of this on your shoulders. Well, that that period of time is is, is 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 difficult for me, and and I think that like one of the things about that podcast piece is that what it allowed when I've only listened to it once um, all the way through, um, but it allowed me and Ian to reach a really lovely moment together, uh, where like a lot of what happened there, um, we'd not we we'd spoken about, but not really spoken about, and hearing each other speak the first time kind of like to somebody else the way, the way that that was that was done was giles phoned bees giles phoned me giles phoned sandy giles phoned everybody who's been been close to this project and to, so to hear the, the the kind of the two of us just to talk about that for the for the first time was quite a monumental moment actually for us after everything we've been through all these years like you know well over a decade of this craziness mm. in chaos city um <laughs> It's just, uh, it was really, really, really good for us. I feel, I feel, mm. I feel, we spoke about it afterwards. We were saying how, how nice it was for us mm. to be able to know that because coming, like, without being too candid, um, just to make it clear, yeah. so there's someone who may have stumbled on this podcast and not know anything about the band. Uh, our guitar player was, was um, hospitalized with, um, after an incident in Southampton. So I felt very, very guilty about that situation because I felt like... Um, Oh, I, I had to call an ambulance to uh, to take him away. So, um, and then uh, that he he was away for over a month, uh, like in the hospital alone. And then when he was let out, he was he wasn't allowed to leave the country. He wasn't allowed to uh, to, to to come back. And I had kind of two choices put in front of me. And two, the two were were stop the band and uh, go pursue something else, which at the time I considered because I was like, well, maybe I can go and. Uh, make a record somewhere, do something, there's something to mm. do. Or there was this other, this other scenario where if Ian came out of this, um, the state he was in and he'd lost the band, then he'd lost, then this, 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 this oh. one day had cost him everything. Like it, it cost him his, his, his whole, his whole thing. Not just his, not just like his livelihood because it was that yeah. too, but like also everything he's ever worked for, 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 for all those years. I, I, I just mentioned to you guys just now, about the the, the 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 vans we slept in, the squats we stayed in, like all that stuff, everything we've ever built together, he lost it all because of this one day. So um, I decided that the best thing to do was to try and carry on and to try and push forward. But I was flying about safety net. Also what, what happened very, uh, like the day before Ian was sectioned, uh, my mother's partner passed away and my mother had come from a situation prior in a very abusive relationship and found herself with a very lovely person, a lo lovely human being. And uh, it, uh, it, just, it just really, really broke my heart. I was very, 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 very upset about what happened to her. She's worked very hard her whole life. She worked for the NHS her entire life. And I was, um, I was, I was in a real state of disrepair. Then the next day, my best friend had this happened to him. And then I found myself, we were supposed to fly. So this, that, my, my mum's partner died on the Sunday. Ian was sitting on the Monday. On the, on the Friday, we were supposed to fly to LA. And I had to decide, yeah. I had to decide whether I was going to fly to LA and carry on making this record. 
an opportunity we may, we never get again in our whole lives. You got you to remember too, uh, as I said to you earlier on, like. We played in bands for seven years before. We had never had any opportunities. You know how, yeah. like these, you, you more than anybody else, you know how how rare these opportunities are to 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 try and do it, and and how a small window in your life you had to do these things. Yeah. So everyone was trying to tell me not to. Apart, like like me and Ian's wife spoke about it a little bit, and uh, Ian's wife Kat, it was so brilliant with him. And what we came out with was. That it was probably the best idea to try and keep going and try to hold it together. And I, uh, at this time as well, bees. I don't know if you remember from that time, um, but I was struggling really difficult, like to, to, to process emotion and things. I, I, I it, Ian, Ian had frequently said that, like, uh, to me, he was, oh, the thing is, you never show any emotion, and so, like, I think that, like, I seemed a lot more durable than I was really at that time, and mm. uh, and I saw myself as that as well. I was like, well, if anyone uh, out of our Friendship group's going to be able to do this. I reckon I'll be all right. Like, you know, I'm going to weather it. But it very, very quickly took its toll, like immediately, uh, almost as soon as I got out there. And um, the way I, like to answer your question very directly, the way I coped with a lot of that was um, through my vices and um, through, uh, uh, through disappearing into these, I mean, I, I, and you know more than anybody as well, how easy it is to disappear into the night in Los Angeles. You can vanish Oh. In, the sh- in the shadows within a within a second, and uh, and so as soon I, I would start work at the studio at twelve o'clock every day. By the time I get out, I'd be ten. I'd meet bees, and we'd go out to the to, to clubs, to, to after hours places, and we just vanish into a cloud of smoke. And um, and that happened frequently, all the time. I was I was an alcoholic at that point, and I'm okay with talking about that now. Um, I was uh, uh, like, like you know, I, I think I'm a lot better now. I don't think it's, I don't think it's completely cleared up, but like, uh, I was, um, I was drinking awfully at the studio every day, like terribly, terribly, terribly. By the time I meet you, I was drunk every single day. Mm. So yeah. So, uh, which kind of leads us on, I guess, to escapism, um, because Hollywood's mental, everybody. Like, this town is fully as, it, again, to come back to the word extreme, like Hollywood and this area is a land of extremes. You want extreme tranquility? Cool. Drive to Malibu about half an hour that way. You've got nothing around you but idyllic situation. Um, if you want to find the seedy underworld of Hollywood, you can find it. Um, so... Was that what you needed at that point in time? Uh, was to just almost primarily rage it out? Because you say about getting... Um, I remember frequently, I was meeting you every time. It was like fresh off the plane. Off the plane, suitcase dropped, like go time. Was was that necessary at that point in time? Because, because it's not... What I didn't see anything eating you up about it. I um, I think I have a, I have a wonderful ability. Is it even wonderful or terrible ability to 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 to, to focus on what's got, what's in front of me that evening? Um, and and what I wanted to do was when I got off the plane after after having I I used to take Xanax in the plane, so I knock myself out and I wake up right. in Los Angeles. I get off and I was trying not to process and deal with a lot of things that were going on. My relationship mm. was falling apart at home, as you, as you know. And, mm. um, and I was very, very unhappy with, uh, with what was going on with Ian and with all this other stuff. It was, so I got off the plane, I get to my hotel, and I put my, my suitcase down, as you said, and I'd be like, I want to have fun now. <laughs> like, no, I, I, I need to have fun. Like, there, there was not, there's not a part of my day where I'm calm. I'm not calm any part of the day. Like there's no part of the day I'm calm except for when I'm seeking out the most insane things <laughs> with you. Like, 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 you know, like uh, very often with you. Like, uh, yeah. With, it, it, like it, 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 the thing about you is, uh, I think there's a thing about people in music, and I imagine a lot of people listening to this can can um, can probably relate. If you're into music as well, if you're like a mosher, like that's what you are. You could probably handle yourself with a beer, and um, <laughs> uh, that's true. You know, you don't, like, you know, 
it's, it's not your first download festival, you know, like, you, 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 we, 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 you know, that's one of those things. And I think that's, that comes along with the territory a lot of the way. So um, me and Terry would, would see through an evening um, in, a, in a manner that you couldn't really imagine. There was things that we saw together over that course of that time that were crazy. <laughs> <laughs> that absolutely crazy. My, fa my favourite was the goat on Hollywood Boulevard. I know, Do you remember yeah. that? Where we were just on Hollywood Boulevard and the dude was walking but, along with a goat. That, that, wasn't, that wasn't even like a late night thing. That was no. Like, it, that was the beginning of our night. That's how we started the night. The goat. Yes, started that's how we night. started the night. <laughs> yeah. And Beans is like, oh, the goat's there. And I'm like, who's the goat, Beans? Like, what is he doing there? Why is there a goat here? That doesn't make any sense. So, yeah, so like, ridiculous. It was so crazy. And but yeah, like the, the after hours things downtown. I don't know if you guys mm -hmm. know, but but like two a.m. Los Angeles is is closed because it's down. But there's always these out of hours things downtown. <laughs> and I, I remember that one night after after the out of hours thing, like some weird club me and bees went to. We were stumbling around at someone's house. Do you remember that piece? And like Mad Men had been filmed on the road, and you're just thinking, yeah. how are we here? Like what what is going <laughs> on? Like this is so crazy and the sun comes up and it's like that when the sun comes up in the uk the sun comes up and it's a million degrees and you're melting you're full of alcohol and yeah it's just crazy it's, it, there was some absolutely insane mm. nights it was bonkers but the the reason why i have to kind of i kind of have to point towards that because i wanted to ask you like was it a lonely time will for it was, you. Yeah, it was. It was. It was, uh, it was some of the darkest moments of my life happened when I was in, in Los Angeles. Um, I uh, I remember calling my mum one night, like uh, after make, making some very silly decisions out there, and um, having to, to like like but out there at three o'clock in the morning. You know, she's all well awake at that point and not expecting or whatever time it was. Uh, I, I was calling mm -hmm. her, and uh, having to really taught me talk taught me into shape and kind of put me together again after like really like a very dangerous situation. Um, mm. And I was very, very trapped and felt very, very cripplingly alone. Um, but like, the thing is, it's also when I look back on it too, like uh, I feel like bees. I don't know how you feel. I feel like when I first landed in Hollywood and the first time looking around and seeing things, I was like, this is a strange place. It's just, like, you know, there, there is, a tourist kind of there's like, uh, like the tourist the tourist level of, of Hollywood is the shallowest level you can see. Mm. The, the real Hollywood exists when you stay there a while, and you slowly start seeing the workings, the things that are happening underneath the surface, kind of the people but below the water, like uh, making how, how it all works. When you journey down there and you live there yourself for a while, then you really start mm. seeing it. And I realized that like. I slowly started making friends in, in Hollywood. Bees, Bees has always been my friend, but Bees happened to live in Hollywood now. But also, like, like you know who I'm talking about when I mentioned our friends yeah. who made out there, like, and you still see them frequently. And uh, yeah. the nights out we, we we had there, slowly I started occurring this kind of weird, like, Ed Wood-ish style <laughs> gang, <laughs> yeah. gang, gang of kind of people that were kind of washed up in Hollywood. I mean, it's kind of all washed up there. And I was like, what I started realizing was that, like, Hollywood is a place where people wash up. People uh, like you know, strange people who don't fit anywhere else. Uh, kind of pe pe people who don't really fit a, a box in, in particular. People are a bit too loud for everybody else. People are a bit too like ex like theatrical for everybody else. All that stuff is there in Hollywood. And I suddenly realized one day at this realization moment, I was like, "Holy shit, that's me. I'm." I live, I, I, I fit here. Like, I mm. fit in this, this box. And I know for a fact that you have felt the same way. That's why you live there now. That you, yeah. you, were, always, you were always meant to be there. Um, I just, so like, it's a weird, it's, it's a weird thing, isn't it? Like, I, I just, I, I think that it's crazy that the weirdest place I've ever known is the place where I feel much most at home. It kind of, unfortunately, I think that's a psych 101 analysis of myself, I guess, and you, which is why we were able to do this. I wanted to I, ask you a bit about, can I ask you about your relationship with America, Will? Because I think that 
Quint is quintessentially creeper will always be British, right? The fact that you used the word copper about a placement earlier warmed my heart in a way that you cannot imagine, mate. Um, but what was your what's your, what's your relationship been like with America, like for the last couple of years? Because it. I know how you feel about it now and you can kind of gauge how you feel about it by listening to the record. But there's also the fact that personally you didn't have a good time on Warped Tour when you came out here. So when you boil it up and I say, what's your relationship with America? What's your answer, man? It's weird. It's weird to be honest with you because like, I love America. I've always had an obsession with America. That's always been my thing. Right from back in when I was a child, like a, uh, I remember my um, my cousin coming back from Universal Studios when I was a kid, and his family are like uh, are uh, were like I, I, I'd taken him out as a child to go to Universal Studios, and he saw in, in Florida this is, and he saw the confrontation right, and he came back and he told me like as a kid as well. I went to America and I saw a giant life size King Kong that moved, and I thought. Like that's my earliest memory of America. Yeah. And I remember thinking, "What do you mean? Like that is amazing." And I think the giant animatronic life-size ape that moves is a great metaphor for America in general. It's it's, it's sensational. It's larger than life. It's it, it, like you can't believe it really exists, but it does. There, you know, <laughs> it, it is it, like the, the the giant animatronic life-size King Kong that moves is. The woman walking around Walmart with a gun on a holster, you know, like that, that, that is that, that is the, that is the giant animatronic ape that moves from, uh, yeah. you know, the studios. Yeah. It's something you can't believe. Like, like it is, uh, the Westboro Baptist Church picketing the warp tour and are standing in front of yeah. it and, and boys kissing boys in front of them to tell them to fuck off. It is, it is the giant F- animatronic yeah. ape. There's, there's the giant animatronic ape from, from, from Universal Studios. I, and I, I, you know, it, all, all of it is, is exactly what I imagined in my head. Warp Tour was difficult for me because it wasn't America that was against me on the Warp Tour. It was the type of people that are on the Warp Tour. Um, not all of them. I had some wonderful friends, Warren Women, and and, and Mike from Old Wounds was was uh, was on the on the tour. I, I, I would sit and smoke with him every single day, and uh, I had a wonderful time with, with those people. And, and TSOL, well, sick of it all, you know. Um, I hate Breedbone on the tour for a little bit as well. Um, just like the, the, these amazing punk rock bands. I think I had in my head it was going to be something different. I think it ended up being a bit bro and a bit jockey from my life. Mm. Um, considering, I guess, maybe maybe I, like maybe I was wrong, but like I felt it, it very clicky. Um, my, band, mm. my band loved it. Like I'm the only person in my band who didn't enjoy it. I just found... A lot of the culture of it, the same people who would have tried to fight me when I was a kid for being mm. into to metal and punk and stuff, and I found a lot of that culture uh, existed uh, on on that tour, in my opinion. Okay. But okay. but I love Ke- Kevin Lyman. I loved him. Um, I thought he was. Mm. A, I think he's a genius. I think he's a, he's another one of those amazing entrepreneurial people, like Vince McMahon or someone like yeah. that. You know, like like the, he, he can't help. He's eat like like. Kevin Lyman's not evil, but Vincent Mann, evil. But you kind of go, you're yeah. from a trailer park and you bought your dad's wrestling company and you made it a billion dollar company. You know what I mean? Yeah, so yeah, I do, yeah. That, that, that is the American dream in a lot of ways. And uh, mm. and uh, I don't know. I just I, I, I just think uh, I think America is, is, is amazing. It's alluring. I love it. I think one day I'll end up living there. I, I've always felt mm. like I, I end up living in Los Angeles, uh, in, in Hollywood. I, I, I've always felt like that's probably where... That's probably where I'll die uh, because <laughs> but, uh, like, the, 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 the times I spent there, like it went from me feeling like, which it was inspired a lot of the record, you know, like feeling like a real alien, being this this very British man from from Hampshire, uh, yeah. like suddenly in Hollywood making an album, to suddenly by the end of it feeling like I would get off the plane and text you and text Alicia and text Danny yeah, and text yeah. people, I, I, and then we have a night out planned, like where did it go? And I was like. This is just like more home than home is right now, you know. Yeah. Like this is like this is more sane than where I'm actually at at home, you know. Um, yeah. I I tell you I tell you why I think you and America are such a natural fit, and this is um, a little bit of an insight into what it's like being your friend, Will. Like I love being around you 
because I love getting to experience how you see the world um, because so many people see the world in black and white and you see it in such enormous technicolor and with America being this kind of place of extremes and fantastical things that, that are there if you seek them um, just your outlook on, on like when I when I put that together, I think what I wanted to ask is how much of this record is fiction and how much of this is fact? Because you just you have this ability to make the mundane fantastical and it's all over sex, death and the infinite void. How much of this record is autobiographical and how much of it is uh, Will and Ian's fantasy land? I think, first off, I really appreciate what you said. That's a very sweet thing, mate. I appreciate that very much. But secondly, what I want to say uh, before I get into that, the, the dealing with your question, I, want, I, I, I think for a second, if you, I can't see your screen now because it's just me <laughs> on my screen, but look around you. There we go. Look around what, what's around you, the things that surround you. You were, <laughs> yeah. never, you, you, yeah. you were, never, you were never built to be, uh, to be in, in England. Like The things you've always liked are a product of I I extravagance and, and yeah. drama and spectacle. That's what we love. That's why we like rock, and rock music is kind of, is it, 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 it kind of almost, even a lot of it's inherently British. You think about Black Sabbath or someone like that, like my favorite mm. band as a kid, you know, the overblown massive show they did, Ozfest back in Milton, Milton Keynes back in 2001, my first show, mm. 2002, Ozzy on that stage, you know, the monsters of rock, like we have it in England. But you yeah. are inher you inherently people would say the two of us right now they would say we were cartoons like in England they would say we were <laughs> yeah cartoons. I could see that yeah they would, totally. they, would, they would say we were cartoons but like in America we're just people you know that's the thing <laughs> yeah. like you know what I mean like, like that's yeah, the I thing do. like 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 you 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 walk out like I, I don't know how many people who, who are listening to this have ever met bees but it's exactly the way you're seeing him now all the time like like you know that, 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 that's just who he is and. Uh, and I love that about you. You never, there's no, there's no, it's almost not performance at all. It's just kind of, you live yeah. it. And, yeah. uh, and, and I love that. Like, I like it's, it's very true. It's very, uh, he'll tell you, he'll, he'll, he'll tell you. He said, he told me some stories about him telling to, telling things to band spaces, like we, he doesn't like their record. And I respect that so much. You just do it, he'll just do it. Not, <laughs> not with any, I just got to point out, not with yeah. any joy. It's the most no, awkward no, thing ever. But, you know, I'm being your friend by saying, I think you could do a bit more of this, this, and this to my ears. And uh, not being your friend is going, it's brilliant. Go get them. Yeah, but, <laughs> right? but, but, but how, how do you get better if you don't have, a, have someone doing that? You know what I mean? Like, I agree. I, I agree. How, 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 how do you? Like, like how do you mm -hmm. get by without having a critic? Like, I remember the very first Art Time Man Here um, EP got reviewed by Kerrang! And, and someone called Ray Alexandra, I remember her name, uh, yeah. reviewed it and gave it two Ks and slammed it. Like, like it, was, oh, it, was, it was all, was slammed it, slammed it. And I was so mad. I had one of those iPods. You remember the huge iPods you had at the time? <laughs> yeah. On the floor. Uh, and, I, and I broke it. I broke my iPod. You know, I was like, ah, I broke my iPod. But, um, I, should, I shouldn't say this here, right? But Ray was a friend of mine on Facebook and unfriended me for no, no reason. So, so, you know, I'm just, I'm, just throwing, I'm just throwing it out there. I don't know, I don't know what I did. <laughs> Well, I, I, anyway. I, 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 I don't know, Ray, but I, I'm, I've actually always been grateful to Ray for that because yeah, they like 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 the, uh, the very first Art of Man Here EP uh, was just this straight up hardcore punk record. I was shouting the whole way through, and when I started like experimenting, that's how I ended up with Creeper. Like so, like kind of that review, I like that that was crap. That made me feel awful. When you know, Kerrang did not need to review that first Art of Man Here record. We were a small DIY punk band. There was no need to do it. No PRs. <laughs> you that it was me <laughs> like you know like there's it, 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 no, no label trying to get you to review it so he got slammed for for no reason to just picked a random local band and decided to slam them and make them feel like shit but i was like i kind of i've always been grateful for it and i've always seen it as, as a pivotal thing um because i think that's the way you get better that's the way you, you got to harness your craft and i think people need that that people like you for that sort of thing 
Uh, anyway, mm. I've forgotten the question. Bees, I've discovered so, a tangent. Uh, no, 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 no. I, I can bring us back. Um, how much of the record is autobiographical yes. and how and how much of it, of it is is fact? Because um, I think there's a massive factor that I haven't, I haven't seen spoken about very much that I'm going to bring up in a minute. But the record itself, when you listen to it, complete start to finish, um, how much of you... The personal you is in the narrative of what we hear. I think uh, the, the the idea of people all the time is that like uh, a lot of the time when I'm performing, it's not me performing; it's it's the character that I'm performing. So it's the same with the record. But like blurring reality and fiction together has always been what we've been trying to do with this project. It's always been to try and blur the lines. So, for example, it, like when we're doing like a uh, some sort of cool press stunt or something like that, where it, I, I want people to, to 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 know it to go, oh, that 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 that's fake. But then go, but is it though? You know, mm. I, like, I want that all the time. Like like the last one we did was the uh, the Coco show, and that was the the most perfect one of them all for that because people didn't know what had happened. Like, and, and it was I I didn't know what would happen too. To be honest, it was, yeah. it was a difficult scenario, but like it was. That, that that's that that's where the band operates best when it's like when it's like like professional wrestling where that when it when mm. it's when it's when it's 1990s WWF where you don't know what's quite real what's quite fake you know that guy hates that guy but but did he really punch him then like or or, or, or did Stone Cold Steve Austin attack uh, Mike Tyson in the ring that looks real <laughs> yeah like, it's, yeah you know what I mean that's when the band operates its best when it's like fiction and and fantasy kind of uh laced together and mixed up so you can't really tell which is which as ter in terms of what's real on this record i would go as far as saying almost everything's real on this record because do you know that the plant that pressed this album in california after it pressed the people record it burnt to the ground <laughs> you're kidding me it burnt are you ground. serious no no it burnt to the ground it burnt to the ground this record's cursed <laughs> This record has been cursed on the very moment it started. You're cursed too, and you know it. <laughs> Everyone involved has been cursed. The the cello player from the Los Angeles uh, Philharmonic Orchestra, who, who played on the record, fell over and broke his leg on the day of recording. Graham Humphreys, the person who does all this amazing tour posters. Have you ever seen the Creeper tour posters? I have one yeah. over there. I can't tell it to you. He did all the uh, Nightmare on Elm Street VHS box covers. Yeah. Uh, he, he got the uh, the brief through to do the new the new keeper thing. Fell down an escalator and broke his leg. Had to start right like, <laughs> from, 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 from bed. It is insane. Randy went through a divorce. Uh, <laughs> Ian Nicholson had a baby. Ian got sectioned. My mum's partner died. I went through all that stuff with my girlfriend. It was like an insane, an insane variety yeah. show, yeah. It, and, and an insane like it was like it was like a what was that show with with horrible Jim Davidson um, on on big break. On no, no, no. It, it, it was on Saturday nights. Big Break was the snooker one. Jim, was it Jim Davidson who did that? You're Maybe thinking about Noel's house party. <laughs> Noel Noel Edmonds. Is that what you're thinking about? Because Jim Davidson definitely did Big Break. <laughs> I thought he did like the Generation Game or something like that. No, that was Bruce Forsythe. <laughs> I, I don't know. Brucey did know. the Generation Game. Anyway. Anyway, <laughs> anyway my, my, my point is it, it, it was a yeah. variety show of nonsense like that was yeah. happening all the time. <laughs> I can't even tell you. Ian Miles has a note on his phone that, like, in his notes folder of all the things that happened, and it's finally being released in a global pandemic. Thing. What is going on? How? After all that stuff, after everything, after everything that happened, it's being released in the middle of a global pandemic. Sure. It's crazy. So, so tr tr truthfully, uh, uh, like. Um, life, uh, like, like in, a, in a more serious context, uh, mm. like, uh, art, like, uh, like life became, be began imitating art um, mm. quite quickly with, with a lot of it. Even though I'd written this story months before, years before um, we began working on it, song-wise, it, um, it had a, it would be on catching up. I mean, we, we I wrote a song, a Annabelle, for example, a song about uh, our experience. Uh, it was about a guy um, propositioning to a girl, going, "I've met God, and God can't save us. Let's live like sinners. Let's live like sin. Like, like let's, let's feel. I, I, I want to feel something. I want to live like a human being." 
but also mm. in reference to uh, the Westboro Baptist Church and our extreme um, experience with them on the water as I mentioned before. But Ian Miles obviously had that experience too, like uh, later mm. uh, that 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 had, uh, that had referenced a lot of that stuff as well. Like it was funny how much our story began catching up with us. And you know, um, I, I I think you know Daniel Picard too, Beast. Um, yeah, like yeah. Rock show. Very, very cool guy. I like Dan a lot. And I know he likes you a lot too. And uh, he uh, he would speak to me about materialization and and, and you kind of, ma ma sorry, manifestation. Manifestation. Mm. And, and, and you're writing something, putting it out there. And uh, and I think that's, a, that's an amazing thing. Both of him and I, like he, he and I are kind of in the same sort of camp with these sorts of things. You, you put things out into the world and that's kind of what comes back sometimes. And uh, mm. yeah, we, 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 I, I wrote this story, this elaborate story came out in the world and my life in so many ways began imitating art. Even before, the record's not even out yet. The people don't even know. I was always, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not, not the laptop over there. Um, but yeah, the, the, lap, the, 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 uh, the record's not even out yet and it is, uh, my life completely mirrors this, this crazy story that we've written. There is, there is something, as some, someone that I played this record to death, mate, we'll talk about that at the end, but there's something that really shines through on this record, and um, I don't want to uh, bridge too much into your personal life, um, but the warm feelings of love when they come are absolutely inescapable on this record like it really pierces through and i don't know if that's because i know you and i take this back to your last trip to los angeles and we were in the rainbow uh so so cliche we were in the rainbow right and <laughs> you, you were getting to the end of the record and it was the first time that i'd seen the shackles drop a bit and you were talking about being in love will um do you think that you feel so much of that on this record? Because um, when those moments come through, the 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 tender, the 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 extreme again feeling of love. Do you think that that's a massive part of Sex, Death, and the Infinite Void? One hundred percent. Like there is, uh, it's it's kind of inescapable, and it's it's one of the things. It's one of the parts that is that no other journalist I've, I've spoken to really, uh, and they, they wouldn't know because they're not you. They didn't live through <laughs> it. Either, or, yeah. also. And 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 you know, I think uh, most people wouldn't really realize that. But yeah, falling in love with somebody um, properly and head over heels in love with somebody. Um, it took me out of a place I, at, at the beginning it was a nightmare it was an absolute nightmare it was a completely a terrible scenario to fall into i didn't i didn't you know you, you never choose to fall in love i think unfortunately these things present themselves and they're so all in, in, in like in, encompassing and they 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 sweep you off your feet and uh and make you into this um this this teenager again that's the te that's the teenage spell that I speak about in cyanide. You know that that crazy like feeling in your chest, like it's uh, it it it's being in you, and you want to get it out so bad. And I realized that my writer's block that was happening for ages and ages and ages dispelled itself when I allowed myself to write about the woman I was in love with. And um, when I started doing that. It was easy to write. It was so easy to write. It was such a lovely experience to do as well because I could just spit this stuff out a million miles per hour. It was so much of it. It was so in part of me. And I was so, at the time, it, I, I was absolutely not supposed to be in love <laughs> I was, uh, mm. with, 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 with this human being. And um, But I couldn't help it. it. It was built up. It was pent up inside of me. And obviously now we live together. I live in this house. In fact, I think this pumpkin... Uh, belongs to her actually um, <laughs> but, uh, but, um, but this is the this is the thing it's a it was a, the sort of love that you can't that you hear about in movies and it's funny because you hear about the movies that have probably been made in hollywood much in the same yeah. way that you live in hollywood and, and we made this record in hollywood and yeah. and yeah uh, i reckon you've been a big part of we how many times have we sat in a bar and we sat outside, and I've been smoking a cigarette, and you've been sipping a really expensive but free poured, uh, like <laughs> like liquor, liquor drink. So, like, this is the thing in America. If, you, if you're, you're listening from the UK, they don't measure things. 
So they just pour it in. Not, and not it always. It's crazy. You spend more for it, but it's so much stronger than the UK. <laughs> so every time I, I would get off the plane, I would go meet bees. Sometimes in Bar Sinister, if you've ever, ever been there. Yeah. And, uh, and, and we go to the bar. And I just order one of those and then one again. And I was, I caught up, you know, like uh, my mm -hmm. jet lag was gone. Uh, two drinks in. But yeah, uh, it, it, that, that, that infatuation, that um, that obsession with somebody yeah. else uh, had, had definitely, you can hear it all through the record. And, and especially that, like, by the time I, I got done with it and things had worked out, um, oh God, I was just, I was so ready. I was so happy for it. It was such a lovely feeling. Um, yeah. And that's how, that's how we ended up what we have. Like this record's so mad. Like who, who else is going to make a record like this right now? It's crazy. Like you met yeah. Zanny Barry. He, he's one of us as well. Like, like another, yeah. another very, very interesting, strange person that like is like, who, who made this record, uh, who, who works in a studio that works with the doors and, uh, you know, like all, all those classic records he made with Hendrix and all that stuff we were recording out of. And you've been there, like, like you know, yeah. those, those places. It was like another one of us. And I know uh, Bees and, uh, and and Sandy got on very, very well. They see eye to eye on a lot of stuff. And uh, yeah. but yeah, it, it's another one of those things. Like Sandy saw that in me. I spoke to him about it a load on this swinging chair that used to sit outside of his um, outside of his, yeah. his, his place. And you know it very well, Bees. Too. I do. I, I do. I, I, used to, I used to sit there and smoke and drink from like a little egg cup, a little bit of whiskey. <laughs> oh, that's Do you remember? <laughs> And I, I was just there. just medicinal. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just drink that every day, and and, and I would talk to him, and he, and, and he would just kind of counsel me through. And then I, in the evening, bees became the counselor, and we go out, and we just get absolutely crazy, and and and, and just see. Because the thing is, in Los Angeles, you can like it, it, it will take you wherever you want to go. If you want to go, yeah. Los Angeles, they're ready to go. Uh, honestly, I've never seen a place like it. You know, some cities in the UK. <laughs> You want to go out and everything's closed. You're like, why am I the only person in the world who wants to get yeah. in Los Angeles? Yeah. It's a different story. Yeah, it's crazy all the time. Um, I want to take you back to one of those moments, actually, Will. Um, <laughs> it was, I thought it was the most impactful moment that, that we shared in the time that you were here. And we were walking down... <laughs> it's so cr this blows my mind man it like it should never have happened for both of us and we're sat here going so i was walking down sunset boulevard with you right and the sun was coming down and we were talking about this record and it you know let's not bullshit each other there's so much riding on it and it's so brave and i would never listen to any of the music because i always i'll talk to you about it but i don't want to hear it until you're done and we were walking down the road in Sunset Boulevard and you said it so sincerely. You said, I just want to make a record that I'm proud of for the rest of my life. It wasn't about spreadsheets and merch bundles and, you know, limited edition drops and all the rest of it. It was purely you, the art and the people that you create the art with in your bubble, creating something that, you wanted to be the centerpiece of your musical legacy. So I ask you, now Sex, Death and the Infinite Void is a week and a half from being here. How do you feel about it? Well, I think that you know uh, more than anybody how uh, how fickle the music industry is. You can be like a hot puppet. You can be a hot puppeteer one minute and you can be yesterday's news the next, but then you can come, then, then, then a second afterwards, you're hot puppeteer again. It's funny. It's a very Ooh. fickle industry. So I, my, my feelings always were, if I had this opportunity in front of me, I know I, I'm at the age. It happened to me a little, a little older. Like I, I got signed when I was 25, I think, uh, than, than others. And so I was always like, let's just put the art first. Every single time. Let's, let's never think about it like a, a money-making scheme. Most bands, I say this all the time, and I said it to you before as well, most bands I meet, whether they like to admit it or not, most of them are so obsessed with making it that they completely forget what they're making. And uh, for me, that is like the one of the main problems with this industry. Um, I just wanted to secure and to etch a little part of myself on like on on the world. You know, like I just wanted to leave 
something that like let a, a lasting impact that that was I'm an artist, you know, like that. That's what I've always wanted to be. I was a filmmaker when I was kind of going to write scripts, when I was going to write music. I'm an artist. Like, I, I don't, like, like if, if I, if I, if, if tomorrow, like, then if next week this record comes out and everyone hates the record and, and we get dropped from our record label and I have to go back to doing other things, I'll just adapt to it because I was in the shit before. Like, I, I've been, I've been in the shit before. I'll work it out. Like, I'd rather do that than just like, churn out another meaningless soulless record we have enough of them you have enough of that nonsense like what we need is in my opinion you have to put out to the world what you what you think uh what you think the world needs and i think you do the same thing because you always have done and I, what, what they need what i felt that the world needed was a really great artistic rock and roll record that uh was uncompromising that didn't care that our audience wanted to hear a fast song once in a while. That was like, you know what? I think these are really good songs. I think this is really, really cool. And uh, the, the turn, one of the times where I knew I'd done all right with it was when Patricia came in and did all those vocal parts. And um, she sat down and listened to the songs for the first time. She never heard any of it. And she sat down and um, the Thorns of Love played that song. And she turned to me and she went, she went Dave would love this and he hates everything. And I was like, that is the he's, coolest thing you've ever said. He's talking about Dave Vanian from The Damned there, everybody. Famous stickler for what he likes and don't like. Yeah, I, I, it, it, was, it was a lovely compliment. And she was, um, she's been the best. It like kind of levels your head when someone like that, uh, that like you, you, you care about knows the record so inside out, like, like, like Patricia as well. She's been involved in so many amazing, important records. She would tell me crazy stories about uh, Los Angeles in in uh, in the eighties and stuff, Biz, as well. Like I, I have some stories to tell you, like her and Debbie Harry and all this stuff. Like it's just fucking so oh, cool, mate. So oh. cool. Then, well, it, you make me want to finish the interview just so I can <laughs> ask you about it. Um, I, I'll, I'll tell you my appraisal then, uh, for what it's worth. Um, I always think I struggle with lyrics, right? Like I can do the vocal melody and I can remember seconds of everything on a record. But if I remember the lyrics, it shows you how much I've listened to the record. This album isn't even out and I know every fucking syllable on it. I think it's so brave. I think it's so bold. And whether people get it or not, because I'll ask you about that in a second, right? Whether they, whether they get it or not as a statement of intent, as an honest creation, and as a collection of unbelievable and eclectic songs. And I will give Hannah her props when I speak to her, but my fucking God, the, the colouring, like Creeper, like on the public surface and where we look to the hub, people go Ian and Will, but my God, God, does Hannah make Will and Ian a better fucking proposition? And that's not to do any disservice to your rhythm section either, right? But this album being unlike anything, an uncategorizable record, um, you pr is that the thing to be proud of? And do you think people will get it? Because, like, that's my, my only concern is not with the music, it's not with the band, it's not with anything, but whether people get it or not. How do you feel about it all? Well, first off, like, I always knew that, like, I, I always, always hoped that uh, you, like, you'd understand this record because I, I felt like you've always liked the, 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 the dreamers and the darers. That's always what you spoke about. Like, you've always had that, like, in every podcast you did, you know, um, you know that that's that's not metal from the, from the very beginning. It was always about that sort of thing, and uh, as time went on, I think like you gave us some some great advice over the course of this thing too, where it was just like follow your vision, see it through, uh, like. And I think that that's the stuff that you need to do. But the truth is, the truth the truth about whether people get it or not. Like truthfully, like I don't know. I don't know what people people are like. I, I, I like. I, I like to think I give people enough credit, like and fans of our band who are intelligent, creative uh, pe people with a broad palette of music will, 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 will follow it through. 
there's going to be some people who don't get it, of course. Happened with AFI, happens with all the best of them, you know, like happens with, mm. happened with David Bowie, you know, like it happened, it, 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 it's good for, for those artists, of course, it, that's fine for us too. These aren't fast punk songs anymore. They're, um, they're big. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a much bigger onion now to peel back and to, to, to discover. And uh, so, I don't know. It doesn't matter really whether people, um, to, to, to me, it doesn't matter whether people get it or don't. But I know there's going to be one person, and I said this to you before, it's that Jim Steinman quote about the kid in Connecticut. There's one kid somewhere who's going to listen to this Unpeel the onion, follow follow the trail, and then find the, the reality in this and, and, and see it for what it is. And I'll allow it to, to kind of wash them up. But you, you, you can't, to, to allow it to happen, you have to kind of forget about what you know about Creeper. You have to just remember it as, as, as a bunch of people who are making multiple films. You wouldn't go to Steven Spielberg, well, this isn't very much like E.T. This isn't very much like, <laughs> like, like, like Jaws. You, you, you yeah, wouldn't do that. Yeah. So this is a different film. We're making something different. It is uh, to sweep you up in an entirely different way, to take you to a different place. And I hope people see it as that. But if they don't, I can understand why. Like people want these days, they like to have a singles rather than albums anyway. And uh, I'm kind of like obsessed with albums, always have been, because that's the way I digest music myself. I'm a little bit older. Uh, where in that sort of regard, and I and, and and releasing a single and then another single and then another single just doesn't appeal to me. I'd, I'd much rather make something like this, where, and this is um, mm. like, like much in the way the, the the records cover is supposed to reflect the look of uh, your parents' records when you inherited them or when you first got your uh, an old copy from Oxfam Music or some dusty old record store or something. It's very much supposed to be like this is. A record that is supposed to be still relevant to you in a year's time or two years' time. So, I don't know. Where, the, the, does that the, the, does that uh, resonate with people now? I can't tell you. I don't. I don't work in 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 a, in, a, uh, in Warner Brothers. I don't work there. I can't tell you the facts and figures about that. Also, I don't care. Yeah. There's a part of you that has to be a, a prick about it. You have to go. Well, the thing is, man, like. You trust me as an artist uh, because you like my old records. Just trust me again. Listen to this a few times and, and do it in the, the lights off. Put your headphones on, lay on your bed and just close your eyes and, and, and just see where this record takes you because I have worked so hard. Uh, like, like, and if you allow me the opportunity to, to put this in your ears, I will promise you I've tried my hardest to imagine a world, a soundscape for you that hopefully with a little bit of imagination will take you somewhere you've never been before and uh and that's that's the goal with this is it's the it's escapism and uh and magic real 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 world magic and all of our favorite records both you and i and and uh, viewers uh, on the internet as well that's what our favorite records did to us and i can't judge whether i've been successful or not that's not my job in this my role in this is not to tell you my record's good uh, because <laughs> of course I think it, I, of course i think it's good i made it uh but like <laughs> <laughs> it, 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 it's up to you, and uh, but I hope yeah. you follow us down with it. Follow us down the rabbit hole with Alice. That's that's the, that's the, that's the hope. Well, I think that it is in a year that has been an absolute blob of shit for the world in general, rock and metal is having an absolutely phenomenal year. This year has been littered with incredible releases, and Sex, Death, and the Infinite Void is in the conversation to sit at the top of the tree of all of it, I believe. I think Thorns of Love you spoke about, and um, you're going to be on my Twitch channel when we'll do a bit more of in-depth song-by-song stuff. I can't stuff. for that, too. That's but really fun. I, t I tell you, man, like, Thorns of Love is a songwriting achievement that they will never, ever, ever be able to take away from you. And as someone that loves that Steinman stuff and yearns for people to do that again. And the reason they can't is because it is so hard to write songs that brilliant. Thorns of Love makes my make, gives me goosebumps even thinking about the, the fact that it exists. And that is just one slice of an incredible fucking record where my favourite song changes all the time. Well, 
be proud of the record that you've made. I hope it is the biggest success. And thank you so much for coming on Mosh Talks today, my friend. Mate, it's been my privilege. And thank you so much, Bees. You've always, from the word go with Creeper, we've all, like we've always had a, a connection, you and I. And I think the band as well, like like we, we're from a very similar place, like like uh, spiritually, I think too. And uh, and I appreciate like what everything you just said there, mate. That, that really makes me feel so lovely about it. And and I. I I appreciate you and I miss you and uh, I hope we get to hang out soon. Mate, sooner than soon. Listen to Sex, Death and the Infinite Voyage. Your life will be better with it in it. We'll see you soon.